and this is the end show and i'm your host gus summers good to be back with you today we got another great show that's right we are broadcasting live from the sunset strip in the entertainment capital of the world hollywood and we have a wonderful in studio guest director producer of the best documentary short subject for this year's oscar mr jason cohen jason thanks for taking the time with us well thanks for having us Gus. Uh, we really appreciate it oh my pleasure how's it feel i'm sure you've been asked this already a thousand times by friends and family uh you know it, it feels great uh we're all everyone involved with the film is super excited about it it's a great honor and to have the recognition um you know it's not something we <laughs> had ever aimed for or planned for. It's not why we made the film, but um, you know, we're happy to have the recognition, and, and we know it's going to help us uh, get the film out to a wider audience, which is uh, was our goal from from the beginning. You know, it, it's a captivating story. I mean, it's, it's it's one of those rare stories that has come around full circle and and beyond what. Uh, what, like you said, what everyone intended. I know we met at the uh, screening at the uh, Museum of Tolerance not too long ago, and you were already on the short list. And here you are actually going to be nominated and possibly winning an Oscar. What I want to ask is, well, let, let's go back to the beginning before I ask that. How did you become aware of uh, Tim and Matthew's story? So I, I was introduced to Matthew and Tim's uh, story through the Fetzer Institute, who the film was made in collaboration with, and um, I was doing a project for them, and they um, they had done some uh, outreach with Matthew and Tim's presentation at the museum, doing some surveys about forgiveness. Uh, Fetzer does work around promoting awareness of love and forgiveness. And uh, they, Matthew and Tim's story was one of um, uh, many that the Institute presented to me when they were interested in making a film about their work, and I sort of went through um, all of them, and, and Matthew and Tim's story just jumped out immediately uh, when I read it, and I knew that it would um, could be visual, and it's just a remarkable story, and I also knew that there was probably a lot that needed to be told about their forgiveness process and what they've been going through the last six or seven years, so um, yeah, so I just uh, felt like it was something we wanted to pursue. It was one of actually... Uh, five uh, five pieces I ended up doing around the world, um, but uh, there's there's really spoke to me. Yes, right. I, I remember you had mentioned that that it was kind of a, a little vignette. It was part of a larger feature that you had done, and and um, somewhere along the line, uh, the decision was made to kind of focus on this one. Tell me about that process. What uh, what stood out? Yeah, so that- it originally was intended to be part of a bigger feature film with these other uh, stories that we did around the world, uh, uh, other stories of people using love and forgiveness, compassion in their fields of work, or just infusing it into their everyday lives. And, um, and you know, after shooting you know, Matthew and Tim's story and putting it together, we had a rough cut, it, it just didn't fit with um, with everything else, and it, we felt like it really worked on its own, and it you know, it had a lot of teeth to it, and it was just, it was, uh, you know, it had the dramatic element, and uh, it had a nice arc to the story. So, uh, and then talking to a couple of our colleagues who were filmmakers, they, they felt that uh, we should just put that out as a short by itself, and um, uh, and eventually qualify for Oscars. So, uh, that's sort of how it came about. It, it, it just, it, 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 worked, it worked on its own. So, we, we just felt like we should put it out by itself. When you were, you know, when when you had seen your feature, and you had put it all together, were they? How can I say it? Um, so you found that this one just really stood out. That this one stand out to you? Yeah. Well, well, backing up actually, because we were um, shooting and editing this film over the course of uh, uh, like a year and a half, and and we would shoot and edit, shoot and edit, and keep shooting and editing other things. So. It never made it into the feature. Uh, we knew after we cut, cut it as a short uh, and that we had cut some of the other ones as shorts, we knew that it just wasn't going to fit into a feature film. So it, it, it was never it was never in it, and then we had to take it out. It, it never even made it in. We just knew that it, it, it was going to be its own thing um, from, from, from early on. Right, right. It was just so compelling to you. So tell, tell me about when you first met uh, Tim and Matthew. Who did you meet first? Um... I, well, we did a phone conversation um, with everybody and to talk about the project. And, okay. Um, I, 
I officially met Matthew first, uh, just because I went to the museum and Matthew works at the museum. Um, so, so I met I met Matthew first, and and then met I met Tim soon afterwards. Um, and uh, you know, I just sort of wanted to let them know that we were going to try to tell a, a, a full story and, and sort of uh, do it rather subtly, I guess, uh, would be a way to describe it. And, not sensationalize any aspect of the story, which uh, could be an easy path to go down because, it, I mean, it's a sensational story. Um, and I, I did explain to them that we were really there to tell the story and then also really to uh, get to their inner feelings and to explore this process of forgiveness that they had now been going through for uh, six or seven years. It was, the, the story is a compelling one, which I want I want to get into. You know, just talk a little bit about the film, and just kind of building up. You know, this uh, till we get to that. You you talk to them individually. I'm sure by now you've had a chance to a- attend one of their one of their meetings. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, we filmed at um, you know we filmed at a couple of their presentations, and uh, that's in the film. Um, you know, it's their their presentations are great because they it's usually with students. Uh, or most of the students, they also go to jails and then they do ones at the museum where uh, anyone who's there at the museum can come in and hear them speak. But they, um, they, 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 they really try to keep their presentation fresh and they, they do that by basically just opening it up to questions. They play a short video uh, beforehand that kind of explains their story, but then they just sort of open it up to questions and let people um, talk about it. And I know, um, you know, with, a, with the film, when we've done that with it and if we do a screening and we do a Q&A after, you know, it, it, it opens up, a, you know, a can of worms, I guess, if, if you want to call it that, it, which is what we wanted. It, it, there's, there's discussions that go on and on. The film is 23 minutes, and we'll end up having a 23-minute film followed by an hour discussion, and people are still talking as we're trying to get out of the theater. So, um, <laughs> you know, that, that that's what we wanted. And, um, you know, Matthew and Tim, are, they've been doing it for a while. They're really comfortable with uh, audiences um, and you know they've, they've gotten comfortable with telling their story uh, I think we tried to go to a few places that they hadn't gone before in telling their story and that was also part of our, our goal in making the film and uh, tell me about that journey I know when uh, when we met at the museum I had a chance to talk with you and Tim and I had asked Tim a, a question about was there something that you know wasn't in the film you know, can he express something? And I asked him about the first time he had met Matthew, and he talked about his his trepidation, his fear, and such. Uh, tell me a little bit about what they mentioned to you that didn't quite make it into the film. Well, you know, with a short film, there's uh, there's a lot that didn't make it in that we 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 tried with putting in, and we would have liked to put in, but we had decided it was going to be a short film, so it was sort of figuring out what stays and what goes, and 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 what that can still drive the story and give enough uh, background to uh, further further the story and keep us going and, and learn more. Um, you know, there was obviously a lot we couldn't get into. There's um, Tim's relationship now with his family, with his son, uh, which, you know, is something that he's still working on. His son, um, you know, has, has had a few problems and, and Tim wonders, you know, if it's because of his upbringing and so there's, you know, a little bit of stuff that he wrestled with with that um, and you know with Matthew you know the stuff from the film we didn't put in Matthew um, you know Matthew ended up actually having a career uh, as a hair colorist in Hollywood in, for, for 20 years before he sort of had a sort of a, a reawakening where he decided he wanted to do something more with his life and then ended up going to the museum to, uh, to do his work there so you know there, there, there's definitely a lot that we had on tape that we just couldn't um, couldn't get in, and, and we tried it a few times, and uh, we just felt like we had gotten down to a nice core of a story arc with enough to sort of carry the uh, viewer through. And, and t- tell me about the, um, uh, your relationship with the museum. I thought it was a great place to have, you know, the, the screening. And you're right, I remember when I was there. Yeah, the the, the panel went at least an hour afterwards, which was great. Right. Tell me about uh, your relationship there. Was it uh, built uh, along with Matthew when uh, when you learned about their story? Yeah, so, you know, so Matthew and I, we, 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 
happy to do the presentation at the Museum of Tolerance. They've been doing it there for about seven years now, and they, and they also go out to schools and jails and other places. But uh, Matthew is the manager of the museum, uh, and we learned in the film that they met because Tim was doing some uh, speaking engagement there, and Matthew was the manager, and they ended up in conversation, and that's how they ended up figuring out who each other were. Um, so, you know, we shot a lot at the museum. Uh, it was a collaboration with the museum and Spencer uh, throughout, and you know, they were very, very hospitable to help us out with what we needed, filming there and, and accessibility to Matthew and, and Tim. And we knew from when we first shot that um, eventually that we wanted to screen the film at the museum. It just um, it made sense, and it was the audience that we really wanted to see the film. Uh, we didn't. We had no idea what. <laughs> what the film was going to do, uh, you know, up to now, but uh, we knew either way we were going to be screening the film there with that audience, with those people that had, you know, given their time in, in that environment uh, uh, still. Uh, that was a, you know, really special screening for us um, to have it there and, and to have the discussion there as well, which, as you said, was uh, a lengthy conversation and discussion which then flowed into the hallways and continued. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, it, it was it was a great night. I mean, it was. I remember it was you know packed to capacity. I don't think there was a, an empty seat in the house, and I, and I remember seeing hands going up. You know, right when the um, the opening session uh, for questions. I, at that point, when you're looking out, because I remember you know it, it was you know all of you up on the stage. Was it kind of a surreal moment? You know, now that it was you know on the short list, possibly being actually going to be nominated? Was it a bit surreal or was it just a a normal gathering, a screening in the, in the normal process of the panel? No, it, no this, you know, we screen the film across the country at film festivals and we screen the film in Amsterdam at uh, it's, uh, the big documentary festival over there. Uh, but th that was definitely, you know, one of the, the more memorable uh, screenings just because of uh, being there and, you know, and also knowing that we had shot a lot of the film just outside the doors from where the film was screening um, and that it was sort of, you know, came to life in that environment. So um, it, it certainly was, you know, one of, uh, if not the most special screening that we've had for everybody. And I think there was a lot of emotion in the room from the museum staff and from Matthew and, and Tim. And, you know, there was a lot of people there that work with them on a regular basis and got to maybe see a, another side of them a little bit. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was definitely a, a special screening. We had, we had amazing screenings, though, everywhere we've been. Um, you know, I, I have to say, we've had great audiences and great discussions and um, just, you know, great reaction um, everywhere we've been. But, uh, yeah, it definitely was a, was a special one. And, and w when you got the call, tell me about when you got the call. Did you get it early in the morning like uh, we hear everyone does, you know, at 5.30, or was it a little later in the well, day? Yeah, I, I, I wish I could say the phone rang and I got the good news, but um, <laughs> I found out like everyone else did. Um, they, they actually don't call you. Uh, I, I was watching the press conference on TV, yeah. uh, and we were told uh, you could watch the press conference at 5.30 in the morning where they announced actor, actress, picture, all the big ones. Yes. And as soon as the press conference is done, they will put the press release up on the Oscars website. So I had the TV on with the press conference. I had the computer open on the web page, uh, and it was refreshing. And <laughs> about five just a few minutes in, I don't even know what, I can't remember now which category they were up to. Right. But I just hit, I just hit refresh on my browser, Yes. not expecting anything, and Boom. they all popped up. So they had posted it actually a little bit before the press conference. Ended. So I was not, I wasn't ready for it. <laughs> I scrolled down and I got there, but I wasn't, I thought it was going to be another 20 minutes before uh, they posted it. So, but I, but, but, yeah, but we found out like everyone else, uh, just, you know, uh, on the web when it was, when it was put up there. It, you, you know, I I, I'd, uh, I have to say, you know, it, it, was, it was rather exciting because, you know, you and I had met and talked. And when I saw it up there, I, I went out and, you know, started promoting. Hey, this is great. You got to, you got to, everyone's got to check out this film. You know, when, when you told your, your family and, uh, you know, the close ones, uh, how were they? What were their reactions like? Uh, you know, everyone, everyone was ecstatic. Um, we were all, you know, as I said, we, this is nothing we expected. Um, so that, you know, as soon as we found out, you know, we put it up and, and the calls went out to everyone at Spencer and to Matthew and to Tim and to uh, all my amazing crew. Um, you know, uh, we were all up early that morning. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> some, some people are on the East Coast, but uh, yeah, everyone was just, 
you know, everyone is just ecstatic. And um, again, it's just, uh, it's great recognition for all the hard work. There were a lot of people involved with this project. It's, it's not just me. I mean, my name is on there, but there, there there's so many people that um, gave a lot and, uh, you know, contributed to this, to this whole thing happening. So, so one more question. We've got to take a quick break, uh, Jason. So, have you have you changed your business cards now to uh, Oscar-nominated director? Uh, no, I haven't. I, you know what? I haven't had time to do no, that. No, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's, been much, uh, it's been pretty much nonstop for a week with uh, interviews, and meetings, and, and uh, you know all that type of stuff. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get around to that. Soon. <laughs> all right, hey, uh, Jason. Again, you know, thanks for uh, you know. Give us a, an interview. I got to take a quick break. Uh, again, you know, appreciate it. Hey, well, this is Gus Summers, and you've been listening to the Inch. And we have in studio guest Mr. Jason Cohen. He is a Oscar nominated director producer for his short subject documentary called Facing Fear. And we're going to have a lot more of him in our next segment. So you hang in there. We'll be right back. And this is The End Show. And I'm your host, Gus Summers. Good to be back with you today. That's why we are broadcasting live from the entertainment capital of the world, Hollywood. And we have a great in-studio guest, Oscar-nominated director, producer of the best documentary short subject, Mr. Jason Cohen. Jason, again, thank you for being with us. Well, thanks so much. I should bring you around with me to do that intro every time I walk in. <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about your journey. What you know got you into filmmaking? Uh, you know, it started uh, you know essentially uh, back in high school or even you know uh, somewhere around there. And I had an interest in journalism, and uh, I was actually more interested in sports journalism. And I went on to college and took journalism classes and and. Um, did a lot of that uh, broadcast news type stuff, but then I started taking film classes and just kind of decided that I wanted to uh, meld those two. I kind of liked the long form a little better than sort of news work. And um, so, yeah, I, I started uh, getting interested in documentary and then, um, you know, moved out to uh, San Francisco and uh, soon after graduating college and uh, started uh, doing a little bit of everything. I used to do sound work camera work and I was always sort of producing a little bit and working in small crews where everybody pitched in and um, you know I worked for years with a, with a Academy nominated and Academy Award winning director named Stephen Okazaki and I worked with him on um, a few films for HBO uh, as well as some others and, um, and then I also spent a lot of time uh, traveling the world on uh, sort of broadcast TV shows uh, that sort of you know, news, newsy style uh, TV or uh, documentary uh, shows uh, that uh, you know, sent me all over the place uh, for for a good chunk of time. So um, you know, it's been it's been a it's been a, a good mix for me. I've got to see a lot, see a lot, and I've worked in a lot of different genres. Uh, I've done some narrative feature work as well um, uh, as a producer, and um, so yeah, it's been it's been, a, it's been a little bit of everything. I try to keep things varied and always try to do a little bit of everything and learn learn as much as I could from different elements of uh, each thing I was working on. Wow, fantastic. So so your interest really was sports. Are you, are you still a big sports fanatic? Yeah, I'm, I'm still a fan. Um, I, I think I just quickly realized that I didn't want it to be my uh, career. Although that being said, I actually have done a lot of work for ESPN and uh, some other sports entities over the years as a freelance producer. Uh, but I just sort of decided I didn't want to be married just to that. Um, so, but I, I, I am still a, a sports fan, probably not as much as I used to be, but I still follow, you know, I still follow it. I, um, so, but, um, but yeah, I just sort of felt like I wanted to expand a little bit beyond that. Beyond that. Although I, I still like sports documentaries and I still, um, you know, love to do some sports documentaries and I, you know, have, you know, some ideas, I think. Stuff, so. Oh, beautiful! Uh, so it's, not, it's not something I completely put out of my life. But. Right. Yeah. So, so when you were a kid, what sports did you play? A little bit of everything. Oh no! I, you know, I <laughs> when I was little, I played a little bit of everything, and then I soon realized that um, I was maybe better at um, being the announcer uh, for the sports than high school rather than playing them. So I, uh, <laughs> I didn't play the uh, you know the 
the announcer for the basketball games and wrestling matches in high school. Um, uh, and I, I played a little bit of uh, uh, tennis and it wasn't uh, particularly great. But I, well, I played, I played a little bit of everything, but I think all the kids around me did. So. Right. Uh, but no, I was, I, was, uh, I was getting thrown into that broadcasting world. Uh, I had that bug as a, as, uh, sort of from a young age. You know, nothing wrong with being a, an announcer or a host. You know, I mean, that, yeah, that's I, a very hot job. I was a radio DJ in college. Oh, uh, were you? Okay. For, 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 for my first uh, first semester at a, at, a, at, a, at a very a very small radio station that um, didn't even reach the other side of campus, <laughs> uh, and so I would I would mostly play records for myself uh, every, every once uh, every Sunday morning or whatever it was. And, uh, yeah, I, I would never get, get, you know, the phone would ring once and it would be a wrong number usually or something like that. <laughs> but it was fun. I, I liked doing it and I, I was talking, I was, I was talking on the air, but I, I probably wasn't talking to many people. <laughs> a, a party of you plus one, that, that's, that's a big listenership for anyone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what, what music did you play? You know, it was at a college station, so it was a lot of, um, Can, indie alternative music for the most part. Nice. Um, and this was in the Midwest. This was in, uh, in Wisconsin, uh, the University of Wisconsin. So there was a lot of, was a, lot of a lot of kind of indie bands in the Midwest uh, around that time. And, uh, so yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, but I could play whatever I want, so it was fun. Yeah, um, I, you know, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Do, do you still follow the uh, the indie scene? Uh, I do. I mean, I, I, I I'm still a little bit of a you know I, I still a little bit of a music buff and, and, and listen to plenty of music and uh, I do listen to I listen to a little bit of everything. To be to be honest, but I, but I do listen to a lot of indie kind of type, type music. Yeah. Oh, that, that, yeah. There's a lot of great musicians and, out and, there. And, and on that note, I, I, you know, for me, music is, is really important in films. Um, yes. Uh, you know, and I, 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 I listen to music all the time. I listen to music in the You know, you know, great, you know, great, great subject that you just brought up. You know, m music in in a uh, feature film. Uh, if you don't mind me uh, probing that just a little bit, I mean, do you uh, watch the film and and I hear some sort of melody, or is it the other way around? Do you hear melody, thinking, oh, you know, it would be great in this feature? Tell me, tell me about that. Uh, no, I think it can be both. I, I, there's been times where I've heard a song and I think, wow, that could work in a film and figuring it out, figuring out where, but you never want to force a, film, a song into a film just because you like it. That, that's a, that, that's sort of a bad trap to get into because then you're, you're, you're sort of forcing the subject matter by putting that music on it. So, um, but, you know, I think more it's sort of, you know, the way we usually do this is we put the film together and we put some temp music up there that we think is the right uh, vein or, you know, in the right mood of what we think we want in the end. And we leave that temp music on and then we get around finding a composer or finding some other music to replace that type of music uh, if it's something that uh, is too out there or we can't get the rights to. Um, so I think it's, you know, I think it's a combination of both. I mean, I think with this film, I knew that throughout the, the music was going to be sort of this uh, very muted, um, you know, moody, um, instrumental uh, music. I mean, we weren't going to have a vocalist in the, out of any of these tracks. It's just not that type of film. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't going to be anything too upbeat. I mean, we, we, we do hit a couple of upbeat moments where it's, you know, we sort of subtly go there. But, um, you know, it's, it's fairly dark subject, subject matter. And uh, we, we sort of knew that we were going to stay in that, in that vein. Right. You know, when you were making the film, did you replace any of the music, or was it uh, pretty much the consistent uh, music throughout the whole thing, from beginning to the end? Well, it, well no, we had temp music uh, okay. to start with, yeah. um, you know, which we always do, and I, you know, you tend to use maybe not mainstream, but a little more mainstream, you know, stuff that's maybe out there a little bit or has been used before in another movie or something like that. And you use that just to kind of get the 
feel. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm trying to remember if any of our temp music actually made it into the final cut. There may have been one sort of interlude track that wasn't too um, too prominent that might have made it into the final track. But then we had a composer who came in, you know, almost at the very end to okay. um, compose a good chunk of the film. And then we had a few other tracks that we bought that um, we felt really worked that, um, better in there. Did, did it, when you saw the end, uh, when you saw uh, the finished product, you know, after the composer came in, did the movie change for you, the color of it, or did it enhance it? Was it the same? Are you, are you saying did it change with the music? Right, after, you know, the composer came in and... Oh, yeah, yeah, and, and you know, the, with the composer, um, you know, our, our composer's name is uh, David Kessler, and um, he, he, you know, there was a lot of back and forth with us. Uh, you know, he would, he would send me a send me a, a track and we would lay it in and see how it worked and, and particularly there was one scene that took a, a, a bit of work to um, to get it right uh, it's one of the, the you know, it's basically the end of the film there's sort of a track that brings us through but it kind of goes through a couple of different emotions so so that one there was, a, there was a bit of back and forth to try to get it right um, you know it's not just a, something we throw on there and it works you want to you do want it to fit with the mood and you don't want it to be too on point uh, to what you're showing, so it's, yeah, it's definitely a, a little bit of a, a little bit of a type type of back type of act that you're uh, you know walking through when you're doing that. Right, and, and the, the composer David, you've uh, you've worked with him in the past. Uh, we had never worked together. Uh, he, I, I, I've known him for a while, and I, I, I knew of his work, and I knew of his work in some. Um, some bands that he used to be in, and he he does a lot of composing for commercials and for some other stuff. So um, so we hadn't actually worked together. That was the first time we actually worked together. But I was very familiar with this work. Wow. Okay. Well, that you know that's uh, that, that's great. And isn't it wonderful when you you get relationships and then you finally get together on the project? Um, I, on this project, had you worked with uh, some of the other principals before? Or? Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, my, my co-producer and editor, Tom Christopher, uh, who's essentially my partner on the project, I mean, we, we did this all together. Uh, we were locked away in the edit room for <laughs> hours upon hours. Uh, you know, it, it was, a lot of times it was just the two of us. We had, we had a couple of people helping out. But, but Tom and I have worked together. We had worked together for five or five or six years or maybe more. We've done a bunch of projects together. And, and, and we were doing this as part of this bigger project for Fetzer. So it was a, it was a much bigger project than we Essentially, uh, worked on for a year and a half. Uh, you know, I'm not counting the PR and promotion of getting the films out, or maybe even a little more than a year and a half. So, so we had a really good working relationship and kind of know how each other works and kind of have a system set up um, with, with him and his editorial system and how we go about putting the film together and, and keeping things organized and story storyboarding it and, and, and all that stuff. So, um, so. Yeah, so that, you know, it's, it's nice when you're comfortable and you can come into a project and there's not anything surprise. you know. If you can cut out those surprises of relationships, then, um, you know, then you only have to deal with the surprises that come up with, uh, you know, in the film and or production, you know, what you're getting story-wise. So. Right. Uh, and then also my, um, you know, our, our, my DP, our cinematographer, Shalana uh, Spetko, who's, you know, extremely talented DP, who's uh, shot, uh, you know, Inside Job, which won the Academy Award a few years ago, and uh, had a couple other, you know, Sundance winners last year, and um, and she's she's great. And we met on a um, on the narrative feature film that I produced uh, about five or I don't know, I guess it's about five years ago when it came out. Although we shot it over the course of about three years, it was a real no budget thing. And, uh, so Savannah and I met on that on that um, shoot, and I had approached her when this came up. And, if she was interested um, in doing it, and she lives in LA, and you know a lot of the shooting basically her took place uh, down here in LA. So um, you know, so again, someone who I was comfortable with and easy to work with, um, and not have to worry about the guessing game of whether there's going to be an issue or not, uh, you know, with the crew. Right. You know, that's you know, it's you know, it's fantastic when you have you know you're 
a great crew that you know you've worked with in the past. You know, when, when you're talking about uh, Tom, as I had a chance to talk to him a little bit, you know, afterwards after the screening and panel, uh, was there ever a time when you guys decided, well, we shouldn't go in this original direction, let's go in this other direction, or did you guys pretty much stay on point in how you wanted to tell the story originally from the storyboards and everything? Um, no, there, you know, there were so many different incarnations of the film, um, and there's things we took out, and there's things we added in, and, um, you know, we had a cut at one point, it didn't have a real open, so we added that, and, um, no, you know, you definitely go through different, um, incarnations, and it could be little things, subtle things, but it could change the film drastically by taking out a certain, uh, sentence here or there, or a certain scene, or a certain piece of footage. Um, or pictures in archival, and, you know, we, with this film also, we, um, you know, we were limited on the archival footage uh, of Matthew and Tim's, because there wasn't a lot, um, you know, Matthew lived on the streets, there were never any pictures of him from that time, um, and Tim, similarly, wasn't, the, the, you know, he didn't have a lot of stuff from him as, a, as from his youth, he was already, like, in this movement, and was not taking a lot of pictures and things like that, so, um, so it was, you know, there was a bit of challenge there, and one thing that did come through was Matthew, um, we were able to get our hands on some of Matthew's home movies through his brother, and that was, it was actually really late in the process. We were, um, we were getting close to finishing, and we had some other ideas for what to use for these shots to talk about Matthew's childhood, and these sort of home movies kind of fell in our lap as a, as a gift, and I was ecstatic. <laughs> and, uh, we went in and uh, got them transferred, they were on big old uh, three-quarter tapes and uh, uh, we got them transferred and it was, you know for us it was you know spectacular that we had that and we could use the shots are really uh, moving and emotional to have those in the film yeah a, a big gold mine there yeah yeah it's definitely you know what's I'm gonna have to take a, a break in a couple minutes but what what I wanted to um, uh, talk about before that was uh, the story of the film which is very fascinating if uh, someone hasn't seen it it's about matthew who was at, i believe age 13 thrown thrown out of his home finally makes his way down to los angeles uh tim is in this uh group of friends who they're basically out and about hollywood about looking for someone basically to stomp on and that person ended up being matthew who they thought was left dead and then how many years later 20 years 25 years uh, 20 26 years later 26 years later they come and see each other at the museum of tolerance that is an incredible story yeah they they they, they meet coincidentally and, and figure out who each other are yeah at the, at the museum so it's yeah it's a pretty a pretty uh remarkable story of, of fate yeah you know, and uh, you know to to be able to you know have someone like you and uh, David and Tom you know be able to you know share that story but also the forgiving process which is what I want to get into in our next segment too because I think there's so much in that that um, that they talk about during the panels and I want to get your point of view on that as well hey well this is Gus Simmers and you've been listening to the intro and we have in studio guests Oscar-nominated director-producer, Mr. Jason Cohen. And we're going to have a lot more of him in our last segment. So you hang in there. We'll be right back. And this is The In Show. And I'm your host, Gus Summers. Good to be back with you today. We have a great in-studio guest, Oscar-nominated director-producer of the best documentary short subject in this year's Oscars, Mr. Jason Cohen, Jason, fantastic story. You know, just I love the whole process of it and how you know you got involved and how the Museum of Tolerance got involved and and Fetzer got involved and you know Tim and Matthew, you know, coming together and sharing their story. The theme of the whole project or, or the theme of the story, uh, the movie is forgiveness. How they met. And they were willing to, you know, go through the process of uh, forgiveness. And it seemed, if, if I remember correctly, uh, it, it's still a journey. It, this is still a constant thing as their friendship develops. Uh, you know, their forgiveness develops and expands. You know, tell me uh, about that from your point of view. You know, what have you, uh, 
you know, gather from it and from the project and from them? Uh, you know, I, you know, I've learned a lot. Um, I think the one thing I've learned, and I think the, the thing that we're trying to convey with the film is that um, forgiveness is not a cut and dry uh, matter. It's uh, <laughs> right. It's different for everybody. Uh, it, it really depends on what you bring to the table with your past experience and your societal factors and um, you know, what happened to you exactly and the relationship if you had you had a relationship with that person before or not. There's just so many so many things that play into it that you cannot just just lump forgiveness in as one thing for everybody. That um, you know, forgiving another person is the same for everybody. It's just it, it's just not how it works and. Um, we wanted to show that in the film that, you know, these two were able to get to the point they're at, um, you know, because of the way things happen and, and because of the factors in their lives. And, uh, there was a lot of struggle, a personal inner struggle to get to where they're at. And it's not easy. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, and it's something that maybe is never fully resolved, even though you might be at a good place with it. Um, probably, you know, something that you might still struggle with or certainly think about. Um, you know, uh, for, for, for your whole life. Right. You know, you know as, as I was watching the film and and um, and afterwards, you know, even uh, to today, I was thinking, look at the surroundings. Here, it couldn't be more perfect because you have Tim and Matthew in this traumatic event. It's, it's not like, you know, Tim stole Matthew's bike and, you know, something that's, you know, easily uh, forgiven they had this traumatic event and then they find themselves of all in of all places the museum of tolerance and not just as you know passerbys but matthew as the director and tim as a representative you know being there speaking and what better place for there to be a an atmosphere for forgiveness do you, did you ever get from them that it was difficult, that they didn't want to, or did they feel pressure because of their surroundings to attempt this reconciliation? Well, let me, uh, first let me just, I'll make one correction because I know Matthew was walking to put this up, that he's the manager. The manager. manager. Okay. But that's okay. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, you know, I, we touched on it in the film a little bit, um, that I, they, they, I don't think they felt like they were necessarily forced. I just think they knew that when they first um, started doing the presentation that they maybe weren't totally ready to be doing it. At least that's how they felt. And, and, and they probably weren't. But because they did start doing it, look what happened. I mean, it sort of, it, 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 everything happens for a reason. And it, because they were not forced into it, but because they were uh, put into a situation where they could do this, it forced, it, it forced them to sort of just uh, talk about it and, and be around each other and get to know each other and I think they both talk about how the you know one of the big steps of forgiveness was just getting to know each other and find out who that person is now um, compared to who they were 20 25 years early so um, you know I, I, I don't think they felt forced I mean in the film we do talk about how they were just not they were a little uncomfortable with it but I think they both look back and realize that um, you know we're glad we did it because uh, you know look look what it's done now and look where we are now and, and, and look how many people have benefited from it as, as a result. Yeah, now, let me ask you do, do you, do you think that the actual location had something to do with the process? Do you think it would have been different if they met like at a bookstore or a, a hamburger joint they just were standing in line and recognized each other versus being at the Museum of Tolerance? Yeah, I, 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 certainly. I, I mean, I, I think it has to. I, I mean, I think in any situation where how you meet that person is going to affect it. But I think being in the museum and uh, being in this sort of um, environment of tolerance, um, and it, 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 it's, a, it's an amazing place to be in and what the museum does. And, um, inspiring when you, when, you, when you walk through that museum and meet Holocaust survivors. And um, so, yeah, I, I, no doubt being in that environment had to have some sort of impact on them. Um, uh, knowing the work they were both doing, I mean, Tim was there as a as a speaker, giving talks about uh, hate and getting out of the movement, and Matthew was there as a manager for the museum and helping out. So um, they, they both knew what the museum was about, and um, 
you know, I'm sure they realize that they're in that situation, they're in this place that is sort of um, spreading the word about this, and I'm sure it, it certainly had an impact on them. Because it's, it, it's, it's amazing to me that when they met, it's apparent that they were already on the road towards forgiveness because they wanted to you know speak about you know things that happened to their lives and it seemed like they were ready and life brought them together that they ever expressed it you know that in that way or something like that did they feel like you know it was you know life's journey and it was life's bringing us together to show the beauty of forgiveness I, I think I can look back at it now. I don't think when they were when they first came back together that they right. thought anything close to that. Um, I think they were they didn't know how to deal with it, and, and they say that in the film they just couldn't be around each other. And um, but yeah, I think I think the word fate has been used. I think they both will, will sort of you know talk about that and that um, you know some maybe some things do happen for a reason. And I think they both do think that that is uh, something they both. Uh, felt and, and thought about, um, but I, um, you know, I, I, I don't think when they first when they first met that that was anywhere uh, in the discussion. <laughs> um, Fate you know, brought us together, <laughs> right? Right. How, how about you personally? I'd like to get your point of view. You know, you you you've been with this project for so long, and it it's blossomed and bloomed into you know you know something so extraordinary, you know, worldwide. You know, what's, what's your take on just uh, this aspect of forgiveness uh, from uh, your point of view to their... Uh, uh, and, and, yeah, yeah, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, yeah. uh, you know the obvious question is, you know, would you, oh. <laughs> would you be able to forgive right. if, you had, if, if you were in math issues? And, you know, and the answer is I, I, I don't know. Uh, as right. I said earlier, it, it's so dependent on your surroundings and your upbringing and everything that is factored in uh, what got you to that point? There's no way I could know if if, um, if I could forgive somebody for, for, for doing that. And then you know it's a question of uh, you know people talk about well, uh, what if um, you know if, if Matthew you know fortunately he didn't, but what if, if he had died that night and you know what would have would the family have been able to give forgive uh, him? You know is, is murder different than um, you know, a, a, a gruesome attack. Uh, so there's just uh, th there's so much to consider, uh, and I I've certainly thought about it all while I was making the film. And right. That crossed my mind, and um, certainly causes you to think when when you go home to deal with people in your life, family or friends, you have disputes and you know, holding grudges and uh, you know, things like that, and on, on a much smaller scale than than what this was. Um, you know, it certainly causes you. Things, uh, a little bit differently. You know, I mean, you, you answered my question before I was able to ask it, and, was, and, and it was going to be, you know, ha has it changed your perspective on, on forgiveness? So it seems like it has, that it's given you a, a, a broader one to look at the, the smaller events in life and see, well, you know, if they're yeah. able to do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for me, it's, I bring it back to my life, which I haven't had a traumatic experience like that, but I, I bring it back to things in my life, whether that's a small dispute. Uh, colleagues or friends or family or um, you know that that's where I can then utilize that and look at it uh, I, I think for me and the other the, the other thing is it, it just caused me to kind of look at what these two men have been through um, and realize you know how heroic they are and, and you know I've never had to deal with or overcome anything close to this in my life and I, I, you know I think you know people people talk about heroes and I said that word gets thrown around uh, somewhat loosely, uh, and you know I think these guys are you know these guys epitomize that um, in, in my eyes at, at least for, for, for what they do every day. Right, in, in the truest sense of the word, they human and overcoming and uh, becoming better, and then sharing and yeah. helping others. You know, yeah, and I, I mean you know this as I said this was part of a bigger project, and I've been around the world filming these other people, and that's just opened my eyes to you know. Uh, what these people are doing in, in, in much more adverse situations than, than, than I live in and than most of the people I'm, uh, I work with or, or, or family and friends live in. So right. I just, it, gives you a, it gives you a new appreciation. You know, you know, I'm remembering you know, the panel 
and I remember uh, because there was a you know nice little event afterwards, and I saw how, you know, it, it's natural. And I could see how people would gravitate towards Matthew and Tim, and you know, ask them questions and really you know want to you know find out from them personally, and and seek advice. And I saw people talking with you have people you know come to you and ask you what you thought about forgi- uh, about forgiveness after the panels and ask you you know kind of intimate questions outside yeah, of the I film. Mean, yeah, you know, people, obviously, people want to know a lot about the funeral story, and that's, you know, that's what we want. <laughs> we we can only include so much. But, right. um, yeah, you know, people want to know if, you know, it, I, I've said that when we made this film, uh, my goal was to make, uh, tell a story and have it be as objective as possible, put these themes and issues out there, uh, including forgiveness, including, um, you know, bullying and hate, and, 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 and then let everyone digest it and figure out how it plays out in their own lives and, and, and what their own feelings on it are. And so for me, I was trying to step back as much as possible in telling the story, as much as you can, obviously, as a, you know, we had to manipulate things and edit things a certain way to make the story work. But, but as much as possible, I try to step back and learn as much as I can and then just kind of pass that learning on through the street um, without uh, having too much of an agenda. Uh, we did not want to tell people that forgiveness is the answer and that you must practice forgiveness because uh, there's I would never there's no way I could do that I, I, I would never do that especially after going through this experience and learning more about them I just I, I could never tell somebody that, that that is the right way for for you to go so um, so yeah I, 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 people are you know they want to hear my take on it and I, I'm Certainly, I'm happy to get it and, and discuss more about uh, things I was going through and, and thinking about and making the film. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic, and I think yeah, I think you guys are in a great position to be able to you know give a fantastic point of view. You know, we just have a few more minutes. I do want to um, give you an opportunity to uh, you know let uh, everyone know you know where they can find out more information. I know you have a website, yeah. Facebook, Twitter, all yeah. that. Yeah. So um, our website is facingfearmovie.com. And uh, if you go there, there's a link to our Facebook page and to our Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at Facebook Fear Movie. Uh, and our Facebook page is sort of updated with the latest news on uh, press and screenings and everything else. And I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to announce that uh, the film is going to be screening with the other Oscar-nominated shorts in uh, uh, 350 theaters around the country in Canada starting uh, in, a, in a week on January 31st. And if you go to our website uh, and, or you go to our Facebook page, there's a link to the, HD, the Shorts HD uh, website that has uh, all the information on that. And you can punch your city in, and it will tell you the theater closest to you where the films are going to be playing. And you can go to that theater and figure out when it's going to be there. Um, so but all, all the Oscar-nominated shorts, animation, live action, and docs are going to be uh, playing around uh, the country, which is this a great agreement that the HD Shorts has had to, to get the films out there. So, um, yeah, and if, 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 uh, like our Facebook page or follow our Twitter, that will have all the updates as we go along, uh, you know, as far as screenings and, and news and press and, and, and things like this guys that will post up there and, and uh, all that other good stuff. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. And uh, how about you? Are you on all those social media sites to uh, be able to find you for your future projects and everything like that? Uh, you know, right now, that's where to find me is through the Facing Fear website and uh, and Twitter uh, and and, uh, and and the Facebook page and the website and uh, on our website there's a link to my personal website so it's Jason Productions you can go there as well and I've got some information on me and some of the other projects that I've been working on so, um, so you can find out more about me there. Oh, fantastic! And, and those new project uh, something coming up for this uh, for this year or, or more 2015. Uh, <laughs> Nothing yet. We've been uh, <laughs> swamped with this. Been pretty, been pretty busy with this, and we actually ah. have finished the feature film, which has the other uh, stories we shot around the world, and oh, wow. it's done sitting on the shelf, and we're figuring out what we're going to do with that one. Uh, we've, been, we've been a little busy with this one, trying to get the yeah. word out. <laughs> right. Now, will, will this one be included in the in the larger feature, or is it going to be no. just a standalone? No, no, no. This is its own. This is its own film. It's its own thing it's now. That's fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, uh, Jason, we, we reached the end. You know, again, congratulations. You know, I don't know. Thanks so much. I, I'm sure you can't hear that enough. 
<laughs> it's a it's a fantastic film and a you know wonderful story and uh, you know a look to um, all your future success and so much more. I know it's coming your way. And, and, and thank you, guys, and, and, and thanks for being one of our early uh, supporters and cheerleaders. We, 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 we do appreciate it. Absolutely, absolutely. It was a wonderful project. You know, do do uh, want to uh, give a shout out to uh, David uh, David Magdal and uh, Tracy and Paul and uh, Asil and other team is they. They were uh, such a great support, great friends of the in show as well. I know they were uh, great. Uh, they backed you yeah, all the way as well. They're doing a fantastic job of getting the word out on the film. They have, and so uh, yeah, can't right. thank them enough. All right, fantastic, Jason. Again, thank you. And yes, we appreciate it. <laughs> okay, take care. Hey, well, this is Gus Summers, and you've been listening to the in show, and we had in studio guest, Oscar nominated director, producer for best documentary short at this year's Oscars, Mr. Jason Cohen. And be sure to visit him at his uh, Facebook page uh, Facing Fear the Movie on Twitter and the dot com. Of course, you can always visit us at the inshow.com where you'll be able to see this link and hear this interview, which will we have up shortly. And of course, look for us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, all those great social media sites. And ladies and gentlemen, Gus has left the building.